From the Rocket Garden at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, we bring you Rocket Talk. Alongside John Coward, Bernie Gunther, so glad to have you with us once again. John, this is a historic place. We are so glad you decided to join us on Rocket Talk. By the way, if you want more Rocket Talk, be sure to subscribe to our channel below. You got a question for John? Yeah. You can leave it in the comments as well. And uh, I know this is a special place for you. You got oh, the yeah. history of NASA and the rockets right here behind you. The, the very early years of NASA human space flight are right here. In the very, very back is a Mercury Redstone. That's the kind that Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom flew up on. Those are just suborbital flights. Over next to that is a Mercury Atlas. Uh, that's the one that took John Glenn, to, the first American to orbit the Earth. And then a little bit in front of that is a Gemini Titan rocket. This is the one that took up our two-man Gemini missions. These are the ones where we learned how to do rendezvous and docking and spacewalking and all the things that we eventually have to go do. When we started out with Mercury, it was just a question of can a human survive in space? Can he survive for a day or two? Can he eat? Can he sleep? Can he function as a normal human being? Then. We went to Gemini, and that's where we're going to start proving the rendezvous and the docking and the spacewalking and the other stuff that we would need for the Apollo missions. Just like I said, it's just exciting to see these old rockets and know that people used to ride on top of these things. And the incredible thing about being here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex is you're just a bus away from finding and seeing the Saturn V. Yeah, the Saturn V. If, if you've never been here and seen a Saturn V, that is the thing to come see because it absolutely dwarfs these rockets that you see behind me. Uh, I think the tallest rocket you see here is probably about 120 feet. Saturn V, 365 feet tall. Monster of a rocket. And a lot of people want to know, are those the real rockets behind us or are we just looking at replicas? I think they're all actually real rockets that would have flown. They were excessed. I know the Saturn V over in the Saturn V Center, that would have been Apollo 18 had we flown that. So yeah, you're seeing the real hardware and just as the astronauts would have seen it on the day they walked out to go fly. Well, one of the big things that we've seen all the rockets and space shuttles do over the last couple of years is go and visit the International Space Station. And for more on that, Savannah Collins, she gives you her tour right here from the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. The International Space Station is one of the most out of this world places you can work and live. Behind me is a 3 8 size replica where kids can get a look at what it's like to be on the space station. play place you can see how the astronauts eat, sleep, work because I'm sure you have a lot of questions about what it's like to live traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. While you may not be able to take a trip to the International Space Station, you can get an up-close look at what it's like right here at the Space Shuttle Atlantis exhibit. Well, what a great little tour there by Savannah Collins. It's pretty cool that you could be here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, not necessarily fly up to the ISS, yeah. but get kind of that same tour, if you will, right here. Absolutely. The uh, Just coming here and seeing all the stuff and knowing that you're at the heart of, of the right stuff, as it were, from back in the day, where we're going to start sending humans into space again. Going back up to the International Space Station, we've got Boeing and SpaceX both working very hard. I have meetings every day since I work in the commercial crew program. I have meetings every day where we talk about the technical issues. We talk about what should be our launch date. What are we targeting for this, that, or the other? We, and, and of course, we bring the crews in. They participate in these conversations. It's just an incredible 
time to be out here and be working on this stuff. Well, we've seen some great launches by ULA, of course, over the last couple of months. And you, you take a look at what Boeing is doing. They're right in contention to have the, the capsule that is going to send uh, humans from American soil back up to outer space. That's correct. Just right down the road from where we are right now, they are building the Starliner spacecraft. They'll launch it from Complex 41 out here on top of an atlas. Like I said, this is the place to be. I don't know why you'd want to be anywhere else. And what is it going to be like? What, what's kind of the timetable that you're looking for to, to start to see Boeing and the Atlas really start to take off and, and see some launches, potentially with humans on? Well, we are targeting to, so the way, the way commercial crew works is first, each of our providers, Boeing and SpaceX, are going to launch uncrewed missions. There will be nobody on board. We do that to verify that they will fly safely. They will each go up and they will dock to the International Space Station. After they've done that, then we're going to put crews on top of them. Now, when that's going to happen, we have target dates. And right now, our target dates are early in 2019 for sending up the crews. That, of course, can slip because, as, as I once had a launch director once tell me, John, I'd rather be on the ground wishing I was in the air than in the air wishing I was on the ground. And that kind of guides our thinking. We want to do this right. You folks will remember forever if we don't do it right. But if we're a few months late, that can be forgotten and forgiven. And you take a look at what's happening right now with Boeing, what's happening with SpaceX. That's probably one of the things that's what's pretty cool right now is you have all this private development helping really fuel NASA. Absolutely correct. The flying is the important thing. You want to get the humans up into space because they can do so much. Robots are fantastic and I'm a big fan of all the robotic explorations going on. But when you put humans up there and you put eyeballs on it and you can sense it and feel it and react real time to the issues that are happening, you can unleash the incredible power of the human mind to go do things that a robot was not programmed to do because whatever happened wasn't fully envisioned. So that's why we're working to get anybody. Once we get these crews up there and we certify these spacecraft and these rockets, we're going to start sending people like you and me up, people who don't have professional astronaut training, who aren't ex-fighter pilots, who aren't these incredible athletes and brainiacs. We're going to get some really good people and we're going to send tourists up there, we're going to send scientists up there. We're going to send everybody. I think we need to send everybody. Yeah, I can't wait. And I think one of the great things about you being a part of NASA and the commercial crew program right now is that we already know who the next generation of astronauts will be and how excited are they, John, about upcoming 2019 and everything that's going to happen. I have uh, recently given a tour of Kennedy Space Center to the most recent class of NASA astronauts and they could not be more excited. This is what an incredible group of overachievers these kids are. And I say kids because they're very much younger than me. But they are all very excited. They, obviously, they wanted to become astronauts. This is a dream people have their entire life. They are exceptional. They're very, very smart and gifted in many ways. And they are very much looking forward to being able to ride the rockets that we're certifying right now. But long term, they're ready to go back to the moon or even more importantly, on to Mars, the big red planet. That's the goal. And a lot of people don't realize that they are right here at Kennedy Space Center, also at Houston, but they're training right now for yes, those they missions. They are. They're training here at Kennedy Space Center. They're training out at Johnson Space Center. They're visiting the various contractors and getting to know them and working with the hardware. It's a long process. The first two years you're an astronaut, you're called an astronaut candidate. And during this time, you do the basic fundamental training. You learn how to do an EVA, or if you're going to specialize in something else, you train for those things. After that, you can get assigned to a mission. Generally speaking, it's a couple of years afterwards before you actually get to go fly one. But these folks are in that astronaut candidate training, the ones that I most recently saw. But there are others. There's the ones that have already been assigned to the SpaceX missions and to the Boeing missions. Those folks are physically in training to go fly very soon. And we had a chance to talk to those astronauts who are readying themselves for the next missions here from Kennedy Space Center. Well, we're here with Eric Bow, uh, next generation of rockets about to go off. How excited are you about being a part uh, of Boeing and this commercial crew program where you're going to be uh, part of the next astronauts leaving since the space shuttle was retired? Well, I'm extremely excited. Uh, me and the rest of the, the crew that's going with me and then also the whole team, uh, we're ready to get back into space with a new space vehicle and looking forward to the future. There's been years of preparation getting you guys ready for 2019, all the exciting things that are happening with the commercial crew program. Exactly. I've been involved with the program off and on for, uh, you know, continuously for about three years or so plus, and then uh, off and on before that for uh, many years. And there's been members of the team that have been involved for even longer than that. What was that moment like when you found out that you were going back to space? Well, I, I considered myself extremely, you know, fortunate to get the opportunity to go again. 
into space, and it's really neat. You know, uh, all of us are, have a test pilot school background on these first flights, and uh, you're really lucky to get a chance to check, you know, test airplanes. But when you get new spaceships to test, it's really, really an honor, and we're really excited about doing it. How exciting is this upcoming year of 2019 to know that uh, you guys are going back to space? That uh, this is really just the precipice uh, of huge things to come. Yeah, well, the, the ride has just begun. You know, you're on the, we're on the roller coaster coming up the top of the hill, and the, the uh, all the work, and the, you know, it's it's going to take us a while to get to the top, so we actually get to launch. And of course, there's a lot of work to do on the launch. But I kind of we're kind of the anticipation is getting bigger. You're kind of you know, just like I said, on a roller coaster, getting ready for the the big ride coming up. And so this is uh, you can't wait to go up the hill, can't, right? Can't can't wait to go up the hill. We're we're basically you know putting our seatbelts on and and uh, working our way up so that the, you know we have the orbital flight test, the unmanned vehicle. And then we have the uh, van flight vehicle, which will uh, CFT, which will happen uh, six months or so after the the, uh, the unmanned vehicle. Uh, Mike, a, a lot of fun things are happening right now in the, yeah. the commercial crew program. How exciting is it to be part of this this next generation of astronauts that are going up? Yeah, I think for for both uh, Victor and I, it's it's definitely a dream come true. Um, you know, it's any space flight is a good space flight, right? And no matter if you're if you're launching on a, a vehicle that's been launching for 60 years, uh, or if you're you're going to be launching on a vehicle that's uh, in its infancy and, and just just happening. And so, uh, there that's always exciting. But as a uh, as a tester um, in the Air Force, that was my background was flight test. And so, getting that opportunity to be a part of something from the beginning like this. Uh, is is just a dream come true. This is me trying not to smile too big, you know, but it, it really is a dream come true. Um, not to just have the opportunity to fly in space, but to also be able to do it from American soil. It just, it's an even um, more unique and more special um, part of this mission that we get to do it from America. Yeah, how important is it for for Americans, for NASA, for, for just the next generation to, to be doing it once again from Cape Canaveral? How, wow. I, I when I came here, I, I wasn't, the biggest NASA history buff, you know. But I personally inside felt that the most important thing NASA could work on right now was reestablishing human spaceflight, uh, human access to low Earth orbit from, from America. So, and I still feel that way, actually, now that I've been here five years. And I really do think that it's something that, uh, while it may not be the sh most important strategic initiative we have going, it is something that I think the public expects from us. And not just America, but I think the planet, right? The, the whole of humanity expects yeah. NASA to lead in human spaceflight. And so I think um, it, it is one of the ultimate things that uh, this agency is working on right now. You guys are both test pilots. What does it mean to you guys to be some of the first, if not the, you know, the first to be up here? <laughs> This is where the smile gets really big, right? <laughs> I mean, it's your dream, right? I mean, that's is from the time you first entered uh, the test pilot school, right? Which we both went through the the Air Force test pilot school out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, from the time you you first show up in that class, uh, that's something that that you can only dream about because. Uh, Quite frankly, these days, there are not a lot of new vehicles. There's not a lot of first flights or second flights right. in, in a new vehicle, whether it's an airplane or it's a spacecraft. And, and so for that timing to, to work out, for us to actually have that opportunity, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also a little unnerving yeah. because, you know, in our previous careers in, in uh, developmental test, you made decisions and you were involved in things that had a lot of risk going along with them. And so what we think about this process, how to train, and the, how mature the vehicle is, I think is, is, is going to be very important to the future of the program. So it also adds, there's a little bit of pressure, I think, that comes with that naturally. But it is exciting. I mean, I think this is, I think if you took a poll, every test pilot out there would love to be in this position. And I mean, it really is, it's, a, it's humbling and it is an honor, and, uh, it, but it's also a, a great opportunity. But of course, you talk about the great history, John, that's behind us, and uh, you take a look at the original Mercury, the original Mercury 7, they had a big part of your life as a young kid growing up. A very big part. I will tell you, as a very young man, when they were first flying rockets, it was a big deal. Now, back in the day, uh, whenever NASA launched a rocket, they interrupted all the networks, and there were only three networks. Where I lived, you could watch ABC, NBC, and CBS. That was it. That's all the TV you had, kids, back in the day. And I tell you what, whenever they launched anything, they preempted all their programming to show that launch. Well, as a very young kid, Saturday morning was the only time you could watch cartoons. 
from 8 until noon. And I swear to you, NASA was always launching on Saturdays from 8 until noon. So as a very young man, I hated the space program, but I was forced to watch space launches. And then finally in 1968, it captured my imagination with men going around the moon on Apollo 8, and I was hooked, and here I am. I love it. Well, the original Mercury 7, that's an incredible story that got everything started right here at Cape Canaveral. If you were to ask a group of kids what they want to be when they grow up, within that mix of answers, you're guaranteed to get at least one astronaut. There was a time when the dream of being an astronaut wasn't conjured up in even the greatest of imaginations. But seven men changed that for American kids forever. In 1959, NASA chose its first ever astronauts. To be one of the few, you had to be no taller than 5'11", less than 180 pounds, under 40, earned a bachelor's degree or the professional equivalent, with 1,500 hours of flight time and qualification to fly jet aircraft. 500 applications were received, which was dwindled down to 110, but in the end, there were only seven, the original Mercury 7. These seven men proved to the United States and the world that this country could make it to space. Once Donald Deke Slayton was selected as one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, he had to wait decades before ever being able to take flight. He was grounded due to an irregular heartbeat, but still worked on the Mercury project. He was the first ever Chief of Astronaut Office, and eventually became the Director of Flight Crew Operations. In 1975, he was approved and flew in the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, the first joint mission with the Soviet Union. Alan Shepard is the first American to travel the final frontier. Shepard completed the suborbital flight in the Freedom 7 in 1961. Ten years later, Shepard would leave Earth's atmosphere again, commanding the Apollo 14 mission and become the fifth man to walk on the moon, and the first one to play golf there. Less than a year later in 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. He blasted into space aboard Mercury's Friendship 7 capsule and traveled around the Earth three times. Glenn made history again when at the age of 77, he became the oldest person to travel in space. The second American to travel to space is Virgil Gus Grissom. He piloted the Liberty Bell 7 spacecraft on the second and final suborbital Mercury test flight. Later he was selected to command the first Apollo manned mission as well. Grissom and his fellow astronauts died during a test of the command module due to an interior fire. Leroy Gordon Gordo Cooper was the youngest of the original seven and took flight twice as a NASA astronaut. He was a part of not only the Mercury program, but Gemini as well. He piloted the longest and final Mercury mission, Mercury Atlas 9, also known as Faith 7 and became the first American astronaut to sleep in space during that 34-hour mission. Walter Wally Schirra holds the title as the only astronaut to fly in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. In each of these, he played an influential role. His first flight was on the Sigma 7, which made five revolutions around the Earth. He commanded Gemini 6A in 1965, and that was the first rendezvous of two manned spacecrafts. The Gemini 6A and Gemini 7 flew in formation for five hours, as close as one foot from each other. Shira also commanded Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo flight. Malcolm Scott Carpenter launched into space on the Aurora 7 in 1962. He was also the backup pilot for John Glenn on the first U.S. orbital mission aboard Friendship 7. Serving as the capsule communicator for this mission, he can be heard saying the famous quote, Godspeed, John Glenn. Towards the end of his NASA career, Carpenter helped develop underwater training for future astronauts and spacewalks. Through their bravery and determination, the original Mercury 7 proved that space flight was possible and paved the way for generations of astronauts to come.
Well, and you talked about the impact that, that the original seven had, and uh, that obviously is the foundation of why we're still here today. It is. Those, those original seven astronauts really did have the right stuff. The movie could not have been, could not have had a better name than it did. And I'll tell you, in the course of my career, one of the great privileges I had was to meet six of the original seven. By the time I got to work out here, Gus Grissom was gone. He had been killed in the Apollo 1 fire. But the other six, I got to meet them all. And, and as a young man, you, you see these people and they're all giants of your imagination and you meet them and they were all really short because you had to be short to fit inside that Mercury capsule. No taller than 5'10". So it was an amazing thing to meet them. Uh, I'll never forget it. It inspired me and, and here we are today. And that group had to be, think about it, such an inspiration. The unknowns, uh, they were plentiful at that time uh, about what could happen and what couldn't happen. In fact, there were nothing but unknowns. Uh, we didn't know what you could do in space. Could you swallow? Could you eat? All these sorts of things. We had to go figure it out. These guys sat on top of a rocket that used to be an ICBM and launched themselves into space. They incredibly brave, incredibly smart and daring, truly truly the right stuff. But of course so many of those astronauts they trained for years for that one moment to be an astronaut but you could do it in one day here at the Kennedy Space Center as our own Eric found out. On May 5th 1961 America sent its first astronaut into space beginning a new era of exploration and discovery. From orbiting the earth to landing on the moon to creating shuttles that carried astronauts to and from an international space station we constantly pushed and exceeded the limits of what we thought was possible. The courage and bravery that it took to exceed those limits was embodied in the men and women of the astronaut program. The best of the best. To be an astronaut, it took an incredible hunger for knowledge and discovery and an even stronger mind. And now, manned spaceflight embarks on a new journey with a new crop of astronauts who will be facing an all too familiar foe. The unknown. And then there's us. We're the next crop of astronaut hopefuls that are seeing if we have what it takes to become NASA astronauts. We're at the astronaut training experience at the Kennedy Space Center in Titusville, Florida and we're gonna find out what it takes to get to and survive on Mars. Here at the ATX, you can navigate Mars train, conduct a spacewalk, and do actual NASA experiments at the Mars Base One Botany Lab. That's right, we're gonna go head to head to find out who's the best. I'm the best. I'm the bestest. We're moving on. We're now inside Mars Base One, where you get to experience life on the red planet and go through rigorous scientific and engineering challenges. To succeed, we need to think quickly on our feet and use all the knowledge and brain power we have. And the old Google machine, am I right? No Google machine? We can't use Google in space? What about if I want to send a Snapchat? How are we supposed to take selfies? I don't understand. I'm confused. Instagram? Looks like we're going to have to rely on the old noodle. Shouldn't be a problem though. Jennifer, I think I know what we need to succeed today. Listen to instructions, believe in yourself, and work as hard as you can. Nope. A montage. Wait, 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 wait. Why are you so frustrated? These greens are obviously delicious, but I think it's time for a Space Dots break. When did you first realize you wanted to become an astronaut? When I found out they get all the Space Dots they can handle. I don't think that's true. Oh, it's true, right? All right, we definitely crushed it at Mars Base One. We can totally survive on Mars. <laughs> Kids, we've made it to the training stages at ATX. Here you can try to land on Mars, do a spacewalk in microgravity, and even hone your docking skills. Well, good thing I wore my dockers today. 
Do you see what I did there? Highbrow humor around here. Why don't we just get in these simulators and let our skills do the talking? Let's do it. Did we get that? Did you get the freeze frame? All right. Now, astronauts have to have nerves of steel in these types of situations. And these are the exact situations that I thrive in. It was a pretty realistic simulation, but I think I crushed it. Pick up one of the soil collectors and place it as close to the target zone as possible. Child's play. Sir, just please walk normally. What do you mean I am walking normally? We had an absolute blast at the Astronaut Training Center. I feel like now we're both fully equipped to be NASA astronauts. It really was amazing learning how to live on Mars and do a spacewalk, and I can't believe how realistic those simulations were. So realistic. I know I had a great time. Right. Now that we know what it takes, now it's your turn. Next time you're here on Florida Space Coast, come check it out. Well, and John, think about the experience as a kid. What bigger playground could you ask than to be here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex? It's a playground for a kid like me. Just like this kid whose greatest adventures in space are yet to come, for all of humanity, our greatest adventures in space are yet to come. And you should come here and see the great history, and it will inspire you to go see all of this and carry us on into the future. One of the great news is if you book your travel down here to the Space Coast, not only can you see the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, check out all the great history behind us, but very likely, as you talked about, if you're coming in 2019, you may get to see some history as history is being made launching the next generation of astronauts. Yeah, if you come down here, and even if we're not launching astronauts, Bernie, we're launching something. You will see something spectacular happen. Well, if you got a question for John Coward or any of our NASA crew, be sure to leave it in the comments below. For John and our entire Rocket Talk crew, I'm Bernie Gunther. We'll see you next time here on Rocket Talk. John, what joke do you got for us today? All right, I got a couple for you. Now, one of them is really, really deep, and probably only 10% of the audience will get it, all right? Okay. Schrodinger's cat walks into a bar and doesn't. That's a tough one, so go look that up. <laughs> the other one is, how many ears does Mr. Spock have? What do you got? Three. Left ear, right ear, and the final front ear. It's a good one. <laughs>